Bamble. Oh, he's hooked this. The six. Magnificent shot. He is an outstanding cricketer, Brendan McCollum, and this is a masterclass. Brendan, uh, thanks for joining us today. Obviously, a tight schedule, so really appreciate you fitting us in tonight and uh, well, this afternoon and uh, a wet day here in Tauranga. Any time for you, yes. Thanks, mate. So I'm actually going to start, um, I'm going to start at the end of the playing side of things. And, and I remember a, an initial discussion we had in a hotel in Perth where you sort of called me over and, and told me that you'd sort of had enough and you were going to call time on your career. And after about 15 seconds of trying to convince you, I realised that I was going to get no <laughs> luck. So do you want to just talk us through what you were feeling at that stage? Yeah, I guess um, I remember the the conversation quite vividly as well. I think I think if we kind of go back a few steps, that like, as you're well aware, my style of leadership was quite consuming, and I sort of knew that I wouldn't be doing it for a long period of time. I'd sort of pour my heart and soul into it, and really immerse myself in not just the environment, but also the the guys within the team's lives as well, and and really sort of invest in it. So I knew that it was it was never going to be a long um, run at it. Um, so I sort of was always slightly aware that at some stage there'd be a time which that had kind of hit me that that there might be the team would need a different direction and, and I think you know I'd, I think I got the timing makes it quite quite good in the end I think because not only was I kind of running out of steam as well um, but also I think the team was ready for a different direction which was Kane and and you know what we've seen from the New Zealand team since uh, I left is is that layer of consistency come about and that's you know very much in Kane's leadership model and and the guys around him and I think they all grew um when uh, when Kane took over so I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty good decision actually <laughs> well yeah I wasn't that keen on it at the time but um I think yeah I think you're right I mean there was a, a different phase isn't there when people come in and and they need to take over and take some more responsibility so yeah look it was a good time it was just heading up to that 2016 World Cup where there was a fairly big transition of players so um, and the boys seemed to front up pretty well there. Did you have any idea at the time around what you, what was next for you? No, not really. And you know what I'm like here, so it's not really my style either. You know, you kind of just, in my opinion, you just immerse yourself in whatever it is and, and you give all of yourself to that, what that task is. And, and I wasn't too worried. Certainly wasn't going to try and protect anything by hanging in there too long. I just wanted to see where it got to. I, I thought I might step out of the game for a little while. Um, but it's funny when you're out of it how quickly you you miss it as well and it's not even the the cricket itself it's the relationships and the people and the um, the camaraderie which you you kind of um, that you get while playing in, in a team sport and um, you know I've been very lucky that since I did leave the New Zealand side um, I've still been able to play in franchise cricket around the world coach in franchise cricket commentate um, be a part of. Uh, not just TV, but also radio, and now obviously into the job here at England. So um, it's been a, a really cool transition. Um, each of those jobs I've taken on, I feel like I've, I've given myself to those jobs as well. Not all of them have worked, um, which is okay as well. Um, but I'm certainly enjoying the one that I've got now. So you did a few coaching gigs to start with. How did you, how did you enjoy it when you first went into it? Was it? it was different, eh? It was, um, obviously, I think being... Captaincy is a bit of a hybrid, is between kind of the players. You're a bit of a conduit between the players and and the coach or, or the coaching staff. Um, but you never really know until you're then thrust into a position of coaching how quite how different it is. And I think it took me just a little while. I was probably quite fortunate that coaching the the uh, Trinidad boys as well. There was so much experience there and I had great relationships with them. I played for them for a number of years that they were really forthcoming with their feedback as well. Not always good either. Some of it. <laughs> Um, but it was really, it was really good feedback, and I think I learnt a, a lot in a short period of time as a coach, and and sort of vowed to continue to evolve and and just work out what my sort of style is. Um, and you know, I, I don't really know if I am a coach, to be honest. I sort of, I don't really get too invested in the technical side of the game as such. I, I kind of just like in the environment, and I like the sort of being able to work with people and work out what, what it is that make them tick. So I don't really know if you'd consider me a coach as such, but um, that's the role I, I guess you've been given in, in, in various format, uh, various 
opportunities I've had, I've certainly learned a lot um, about different ways and different methods that, that work and, and some that don't. And I think it's sort of shaped me a little bit in, in my thinking around coaching. So you've, you were, as I said, doing a bit of radio, doing a bit of commentary, doing a bit of coaching in the IPL. And then you, you decided to, to give this coaching gig a decent crack um, in terms of take it on full time. What was, the, what was your motivation? Uh, well, probably... Because it's a hard... I mean, coaching can be quite challenging at times. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know what I'm like. Yes, I love people, you know. There's sort of... I love seeing people being able to achieve things which they initially had dreams of, and then sometimes it's, those dreams are kind of whittled down a little bit because of pressures and anxieties and failures and, and sometimes environments as well. So what I love about being a coach is the ability to free guys up to be able to create an environment where... You, you just remind them of those initial dreams and aspirations you had and you try and work out how do you how do you play a small part in being able to continue to give them the freedom and the confidence um, and the consistency of message to get them to be better than what maybe or to, to achieve what they initially set out to achieve. So that's why I got into it. Um, I, didn't, I don't get into it necessarily for winning or losing. Obviously, but winning is great and, and ultimately we we're gauged, uh, we're judged on whether we win or whether we lose, but I genuinely, it doesn't bother me whether if we win or we lose. It's for me, don't get me wrong, I still smoke a cigar and have a red wine after a test match win, but for me, it's the, it's, are we able to, are we able to free ourselves up enough to handle the pressures, to handle all of the external noise and things, and to handle the self doubt to still go out there and have a crack if we are and we get beat? Sweet as, if we, you know, if we don't do that, then that's to me where I've failed somewhere along the line. So that's kind of my assessment of, well, my self judgment of myself as a coach is very much geared around that. Is if we're not able to free someone up, then that's our problem, not not so much theirs. So I know you, like you very much believe in, in what you do. So I mean, many coaches will say be brave and go out and play aggressively, but if it doesn't work, they're the first ones to sort of potentially hide behind the door, whereas you you back it and support it, and that's something that your players, I know, really appreciate. So how did you, how did your first meeting go with some of the senior players when you said, hey, this is, obviously you would have talked with Ben, I'm sure, but hey, this is the way we want to play, and for us to get that consistent success over time, but we will have the odd up and down. How did, how did your, your first chat go? Well, I didn't really have to do a great deal, to be honest, yes, because I think there was a thirst for change anyway, I think. And I, it's probably well documented that there was, things hadn't been that rosy within the test lineup for the previous kind of 18 months or so. And there's various factors there as well. And I, whenever I talk about this, I always say that it must have been incredibly difficult for the previous regime to have gone through COVID, the restrictions that were put in place, the bubbles that these guys had to operate around. When you think of the scale of the English cricket side and, and the media and the, the following of everything, and then you throw all of those those um, parameters and the COVID battles on top, it must have been very difficult. So I feel sorry for those guys um, that they had to had to keep thrusting these boys forward throughout that. But the conversations were really easy because they were ready to go. They were ready for something different. They skills not a problem. Like, <laughs> the skill level within the England side is is quite incredible um, it's how do we allow them allow the guys to get that skill to come out so what is the language that we talk what is the messages what is the consistency of those messages um, how do we bring the fun element back where you know, you're, you're that little boy that fell in love with the game I think I've said it many times um, throughout my own career that when you get to that stage that you want to play for that for that that kid then the game becomes so much more fun and funnily enough your results will will follow. So it's just those kind of conversations and trying to really force the guys together because, you know, this this everyone's gonna evolve at different stages, but when you've got enough of the the group who are wanting to take this team to a different level, then you're gonna be able to implement some change. You've bought that similar, I guess I would say aggressive but but a real attacking mindset to the, the England test team that obviously we're gonna see um, in New Zealand this season. You talked about before there was a holy the skill in the group. Um, what, what have you been most impressed by with the, the current England test side? Because it's been an extraordinary start. Skill definitely um, is 
I thought they were. I thought these boys were good. I didn't realise they're quite this good. And I'm not just talking about the the top layer of players, but been lucky enough to see the Lions um, stuff, which is equivalent of the New Zealand A kind of program, um, and some of the county players underneath. And there is just so much talent which sits within English cricket. Um, it's just about harnessing that talent. It's about having a purpose and a and a. Um, belief within the top side which will hopefully permeate out over time which becomes second nature for the team and I think with the skipper Stokes he, he I mean he is a box office cricketer right like he's he, you're paying your admin fee to go and watch Ben Stokes turn up he's a wholehearted cricketer he's a tremendous skilled athlete but he is a brilliant leader as well and he writes his own scripts you know, he he makes things happen um, and I feel like the team is kind of is kind of in his his sort of personality, his yeah, his mould, um, which is pretty kind. Of, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that's impressed me the most, not just skill and Stokesy's um, skills as a leader and as a person, but also how guys are brought into the vision that, that the skipper has for the side. Um, it's very easy, I think, in cricket to to worry about your own stats and to be that player who just cares about getting his paycheck and getting his, his run so that in the end of his career he can look up on the on the record books and say, oh, look what I achieved. It's, it's very easy to do that. It's very hard to give yourself to an environment and to a team um, and not be concerned about those stats, just trust in that, that you'll get there anyway. Um, and, or you may not, and that's okay. But the time that you've got as a cricketer, you want it to be... Uh, a pretty um, memorable period in your life um, and that's what I feel like these guys have done is they've really worked that out and they've, they've given themselves to to the skipper's um, direction that he's trying to lead them in. But let's just move on to, to leadership, I guess, captaincy and you know I've obviously known you growing up um, and I actually remember um, I remember you being in the under-19 Otago side and your brother was captain um, what was it like playing under your brother? Who made that decision? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Nath, Nath was a really good leader, actually. Um, he was a, he was different. I think his read on the game was really good. Um, I think he he was always invested in the teams w which he was with. You know, even when he right throughout, I remember watching after I'd retired, he was still playing and watching him on TV. And he's still chasing the ball as hard as he can to the boundary. He's still shining the ball. He's still getting himself and all the hot positions, wanting to bowl the tough overs. Like, like he was an absolute dream as as a oh, as a coach. Or as a coach, you know, although right. he batted way too long in the nets for his output with runs yeah. in the middle. But he slung it fresh air a lot, didn't yeah. he? And he had the most amount of bats in the team, even though he batted at number nine. But that was, <laughs> you know, that's that's mattress. But as a leader, he was really good because you know he he would give himself to the to the group. So, no, I enjoyed it. I think. You know, we're very different in how we lead teams as well, but we've also got some similarities. Once you'd play, join the New Zealand team, obviously that, that captaincy stopped because you were young, you are in the team, and you didn't captain a team for a long time. Uh, but you'd sort of had that grounding. And then you came in for the, the tour of South Africa, where uh, I think South Africa were number one in the world. Well, we probably both knew it was going to be, it was going to be a challenge. And look, I think we know things didn't start off as well as we would have liked. Um, <laughs> That's an understatement. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I remember the uh, I remember the meeting the night before and all the discussion beforehand before before that match um, about the toss and the wind and the the table mountain and those sort of things. Well, it's interesting because that's a for me that's a really important point that there's a lot of thinking going on there. Like there's not a lot of instinct. There's a lot of thinking and and again I think moments like that shape you as a leader. It's nice to be prepared. It's good to sort of plan as if you live forever, but live as if you die tomorrow. And, and the fact that you've got to immerse yourself in the moment and make decisions right then and there, which I think that shaped me over those those bad moments. Kind of shaped me over the course of my my captaincy career, and have also done with my coaching career because I think there is a massive tendency in this game to overthink. Um, and I think I was a great example of that. And that. Uh, in that uh, that first test match. So, you know, it was one of those things which uh, it wasn't ideal at the time, um, but like no one died. It was, you know, we, the sun came up the next day and and it wasn't 
anything I was proud of at all. Um, but I actually wouldn't change it. Yes, so I thought it was it was something which definitely has changed me as a person because I had to go through it. Which, if that's the overall outcome, it was worth going through. Well, I was there as well. <laughs> I do remember someone coming up and saying, "Geez, it looks a bit dry underneath." <laughs> from that time, yeah, from that time till when you finished as captain, what were some of the things you were most proud of um, as a test captain? Because we were once again we were eighth in the world at that stage as well. I thought we finished. We were able to, I think we knew who we were as a team. I think we, you know, we kept some pretty pretty simple philosophies as a group. Um, guys really immersed themselves in where the team was going and what we were trying to achieve. Um, and I think we we're pretty, what we set out to achieve in terms of that night in Cape Town and wanting to be good representations of Kiwi people with the Kiwi traits and, and sort of try and play that style of cricket on the field, I think we achieved it. Uh, we didn't win everything, um, but we certainly went a long way towards it, and I think left it in a better position than, than perhaps uh, I took it over. So, you know, that's probably what I'm most proud of, and also the relationships, you know. We've got some friends for life, which we, we played with throughout those, that, that, uh, that period, and we went through a lot together, and, and we'll, uh, we create a lot of memories as well, and now we've got some friendships which last forever. Yeah, so there's some, there's some players there just starting out their careers, weren't there, sort of at there or just afterwards that are still playing now. You know, I think of, I think of Tim and Trent, obviously, each one's obviously came, was, was involved, but he was probably just taking on some, some leadership roles there. BJ Watling sort of came in after that, and he was a bit of a rock, I suppose. Yeah, it's interesting, those, those types of characters that that, that we wanted to represent New Zealand stood the test of time, I suppose. Yeah, and took it to a new level after as well, which which is the greatest, that's probably the most proud aspect of it all as well, is seeing how much they really grew when they were left, when, when I stepped away, <laughs> and probably when you stepped away as well, it's sort of like then the guys really sort of blossomed from that point on, and, and that's, that's what you want, I reckon, because the last thing you want is when you step out the door, the, all of the, all, everything crumbles. That's not what you want. You want it to actually flourish and get better and, and then start to go on a, on a path. So that's something I'm really proud of is that watching those guys sort of develop over the, their careers and, and turn into not just great cricketers, but family men. You know, they've all got kids now and their wives and, and great careers behind them and, and strong leaders within the New Zealand side. So it's been it's quite cool to be able to see it from afar even though now I'm obviously competing against them. But it's still, it's nice to, to see the growth of them as leaders and, and people. And I'm sure they'll be the first to come up and shake your hand at the ground as well, which is not always the case when people change camps, you know? Yeah, now they're a bit older as well. They don't mind buying me a beer, whereas before it was sort of, I had, I had to do all the buying. So <laughs> it's nice to be able to get one back here right now and then. If we come back to the Black Caps, we think about White Bull. And when you, when you took over the, the captaincy in White Bull, we were knights in the world. So we were, and we were about, I guess, two and a half to three, three years out from a World Cup. And then we arrived at the World Cup and we were in pretty good, we were pretty good touch. And we we actually had some pretty tough decisions to make around the squad and who we were going to pick and who we were going to leave out. Um, and I remember vividly having a pretty strong discussion, not strong, a lengthy discussion around who we were going to leave out from a bowling point of view. Um, and in the end, Matt Henry was the one who was unfortunate, but uh, he came back in at a pretty important time, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I remember that conversation as well. And I guess that's one of the things with our relationship that when captain and coach, he was, we obviously get on really well and have got a lot of history there as well. But I think the beauty of our relationship is that majority of the time we'd agree, but on the odd occasion we wouldn't. We wouldn't be afraid to have a robust conversation around it. And, and it was OK if we didn't agree. We'd, we'd kind of disagree and commit and we'd we'd move Box on and support whatever decision was eventually made. And I think that was probably a real important part of, of how our relationship worked as, as a captain and coach. And, and we kind of plugged different gaps for one another. So I do remember that conversation. And uh, the reason for it was that I felt that Matt Henry, whilst he's incredibly talented, he probably hadn't played the volume of cricket yet um, to handle, well, I say I, we had that conversation. <laughs> and, and so it was about, there was still cricket going on while the World Cup was happening, so he would benefit from playing domestically rather than sitting on the sideline and perhaps maybe being called upon um, to come in. So 
you know, we had experience within that group. Um, Kyle Mills, Mitchell McLennigan, my brother as well. Um, so we had experience and, and also guys who would be able to handle the pressures of a World Cup and still not playing and be very supportive and contribute to the team. And, and that's kind of the, the reasoning for it, um, rightly or wrongly. And then funnily enough, um, Adam, Adam Mill went down and we then brought Matt Henry into, into the side and he came straight into the, into the playing league. And so it was hard on you know, the guys who weren't, um, who were in the squad who didn't get the opportunity, but it was very much a light flight replacement and that. So, hey, I thought we got it, we got it reasonably right. We had a pretty good race throughout that entire. We managed tournament. to pick Grant Elliott from nowhere, which is a, in the end, was a bit of a master stroke. I can't remember which way that came from, to be honest, but. Well, he's always We looked at him there. for a while, didn't we? Well, he was always going to be in there. It was just, there was no point in. We knew what Grant could do, so there was no point in taking him on ah. various tours. So give other guys opportunity, and then when the timing's right, then let the jab come in and do his thing. He was, he was outstanding. What a great team man Grant Elliott is. <laughs> Absolute beauty. Elliot on strike. Elliot hits it up into the grandstand, and New Zealand are in the World Cup final. Grant Elliot, Superman. New Zealand goes wild. They're making the trip for the big prize. Grant Elliot, what a super innings. Grant Elliot takes them home. First game of the World Cup. We, as I said, we'd had a pretty good run leading up to it. There was a huge amount of expectation, I guess, because we'd, you know, we'd, we'd played some pretty good cricket. Um, and we played at Hagley. It was overcast, similar to today. Um, I think we lost the toss, which was pretty consistent for us. Um, and we got chucked in. And you went out there to bat with, with Gup. And I just, you know, what was your, what was your thinking? You know, we were quite, in the changing room, we were probably a little bit nervous just because of a bit of uncertainty around. How did you how did you approach that first that first game? To be honest, I was so confident in our abilities heading into that World Cup. I thought it was just written in the stars that we were going to have a standout tournament if we could handle the pressure and and if we were able to play a style of cricket which the country would get behind. We saw it in '92. We sort of forecasted it for for 2015, and there was a couple of elements which had to fall into place. And if they did, um, then we'd have a pretty incredible six weeks or so. And, um, so I sort of, in my head, I, I felt like it wasn't, it wasn't actually that big a deal. It was kind of, it was an opportunity, and and the opportunity was to try and grab the country early in, in the tournament. And McCullen makes a statement, a first ball statement, the first boundary, and New Zealand get to six. Like that, that's magnificent. Boy, one off the front foot, one off the back. Oh, it's gone straight back over his head. What a blow this is. I knew Malinga was obviously the best bowler, so he was going to be the biggest danger. But I think for so long, we, when we played Sri Lanka, we'd always try to see off Malinga rather than, you know, if you take down the strongest link within the side, then the impact it has on the remainder. So I was kind of like, well, we'll have a crack, you know, we'll see how we go. If, if I get out, then someone else will have a crack. And, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So um, I think you know, that sort of set the tone a little bit for how the rest of the thing unfolded. But honestly, I was so confident in in the team and, and how we'd handle all the pressures of playing in the World Cup. And I just so desperate as I know you were for us just to enjoy it too. I mean, the opportunity to play a home World Cup um, comes around once in a lifetime, and and if you're so caught up in the fear of failure through that and you don't enjoy the whole time, then Kind of what's the point? So that was that was what I, I wanted us to try and do right throughout that tournament. Yeah, I mean three overs in the, the whole tone of the changing room had changed, you know. And for the rest of the tournament, we rode the wave. I think it was yeah, you hit Kulasekar over <laughs> over extra cover for four, and then yeah, ran down the wicket a couple of times with Malinga, and all the shackles had been broken. It was it was pretty cool. And as you said, you just saw the other boys just lift, and and things sort of trickled along pretty nicely. Or, or we rode a bit of a wave there. And I remember going through Wellington Airport halfway through the tournament and all the well wishes coming up and they just said, just clapping us when we got on a plane and just simple things like that, which were like, hey, the country's really got behind us. Um, is it the way you felt? Yeah, definitely. And I think within the team, our, our kind of catch cry was always, 
it's the greatest time of your life. Like this six weeks was literally the greatest time of your life as a international sportsman, and the country were incredibly um, supportive right throughout that tournament. And you know, we had such a good time. It was it was something I'll, I'll never I'll never really forget. I think even now the impact of what we were able to achieve, whilst we didn't win the tournament, I think the impact of um, just like in '92 and the impact of what Martin Crow's um, team, you know, the young guns had had done, um, inspired a generation of cricketers. I, I felt like the 2015 World Cup side, the impact of that will be coming, starting to come through in the next couple of years, if it hasn't already. Um, for those guys who would have been 10, 11, you know, 15 years of age, the next generation of cricketers, it'll be interesting to find out when, in five years' time, or, or even now, if the, any of those guys who have made it to the top were, if that was kind of their moment as well. I, I got a sneaking suspicion that it would be. So let's fast forward to the semi final. And it was a bit stop start affair. It was a bit of rain. And then in the end, we basically needed 300 uh, off 43 overs, I think it was. And it was, a, it was a 10 minute break between innings. Obviously, we'd been on and off, so it was short and sharp. And I remember uh, Macca going over to, to have a chat to you about sort of how to go about things. And I remember you just saying in a nice, calm and polite way, Mac, it's OK, mate, I've got this. <laughs> I can't remember that. <laughs> I remember that because I remember Mac going over. He would have had some profound words to say and he would have been, obviously... But you were like, you were very much like, hey, it's OK, mate, I've, I've got this. And then you proceeded to get 59 of 26 balls, I think it was. Um, and it sort of broke the back of the chase a bit. Oh, extra cover, half a dozen. Thank you very much says Brendan McCullum. Swung away for six more. Been spared for the most part. Not now. Oh dear, that is enormous. Flat, hard, four more. Oh, that's over the top. My word. There is no catching that unless you've got an orange shirt on. Through the offside this time, four more. And 50 for Brendan McCullum in 22 deliveries. You know, we always think about the, the back end of the jab, um, Corey Anderson, but but you sort of broke the back of it. So what what was your mindset going into that innings? Again, I honestly, I, I didn't think we, were, we could be beaten. It was, I knew that they got a, a reasonable score, but I don't know, I just had such confidence within that within the entire group, and even the guys who weren't playing, you know, so much confidence within the group that it was our time. Um, and so naturally I was going to try and take the aggressive options right throughout because I felt that even luck was on our side. I felt that that it was it was kind of destiny for us. So, again, the best way to do that, the matchups for me within that bowling lineup were were Dale Steyn and, and Werner Flander and the like. So I had to be aggressive early. Um, for us to to sort of get underway. So that was kind of what it felt. And obviously, you know, we had other players in tremendous form. Gupp had just come off 230 odd in the in the quarter final and, and other guys had played superb right throughout. So I, I don't know, I just felt like my role within that team was always to try and land the first punch and and in, in particular in that semi final, I felt like it was possible and you know if we could get the crowd going again as well and got it in behind us, then then we'd be somewhere somewhere in the finish. And then, you know, if you're in a tight finish, then I was going to back our boys over over anyone really. Um, and thankfully, it, it, it played out that way. Yeah, look, it was a it was a pretty special time for for us as a group. You know, obviously first final. Um, you know, the country very much got behind us. Look, we all know that the final didn't go our way, um, but we still played the same way. You know, we still went over there. We we lived or died by the sword, I guess. We, we played the same way throughout. Didn't work, that's okay. I mean, it'd be, it would have been great to have lift, lifted the trophy, but does it define you as a cricket team? I don't necessarily think it does. I think the impact that that team had was bigger than, than winning or losing. Um, we ran into Australia on a day which they were too good for us. That's life, though. It's okay, absolutely. Jeez, it was a good run. <laughs> absolutely. Still look back, I mean, go through every one of those games. It was, a, it was an amazing six weeks, you know, just from being part of that group. You know, I think a lot of perception when people talk about Brendan McCullum as a cricketer, often they think of you as a, as a highly skilled, aggressive sort of a player in terms of the way you take the game on. Um, how do you think your game evolved from 
when you're a keeper bat, and then you you transitioned um, into you know playing purely as a batsman. How does your understanding of Test cricket sort of change from a batting point of view? I think I sort of just came a little bit more at peace of, with where I was at as a cricketer. I think kind of once I realised that I was never going to be a super consistent type of player, and that's okay, um, and just embrace that. And for me. What I, I'd always say to myself is chase great moments. So embrace the inconsistency that comes with playing the style of cricket that I did, but chase great moments. Chase those moments which might only happen, say, twice in your life, but it's worth it because you can make defining moments in, over the course of, of the history of the game. And, and that's what I was kind of chasing. And, um, and, yeah, I think once I did that, funnily enough, my game actually got better. It's funny, I, I genuinely think Test Crew was actually my best form of the game, um, particularly the last sort of four years of my career, probably throughout the captaincy. I think when I was just focused on batting and I had the captaincy away from wick keeping, I, not that I'm a big stats man, but I think it actually it was pretty competitive with, with players around the world at that stage. So, you know, I think for all of the, the, white, uh, the white ball cricket and the sort of innings that you play, Occasionally, I, I kind of felt most comfortable at playing Test cricket, and and um, and that's that's pretty cool because that was always the game I loved the most. Um, so you know, it was nice to be able to have some moments, albeit not as many as what you probably would want. But I think I got there towards the end where I felt felt like I was a good enough player at that level. You know, you played some pretty some pretty extraordinary innings, I guess. 2014, um, 1100 runs in a Test. Kane's the only other. New Zealander to do that, um, and you started that off with uh, you started that off the double hundred against India at Eden Park, um, 224 it was. Um, was that the longest you'd batted in first class cricket at that point? Nah, no, nah, I don't think so. I got because I got a double hundred against India over in India, and it was hot. Yeah, that was yeah, it was yeah. earlier. Yeah, you forgot about that one, eh? Well, no, it wasn't 2014. I was trying to sort of <laughs> pump up the, the post, sort of box it all into that one year where you went double hundred, triple hundred, double hundred. In about two months, it was... Uh, I can't remember. A lot of protein shakes, I reckon. I can't remember. You know what I'm like? I'm terrible at sort of recalling games and things, but I remember that it's, there was moments throughout that summer where games could have gone either way, and, and I think our guys actually took some really positive... Options. They were number one in the world at the time as well, and we we knocked them over at, at uh, Auckland, and then we obviously did what we did at Wellington as well. So it was probably a, a really pivotal moment for us as a cricket team actually um, throughout that summer. So it was nice to be able to play some sort of hand in it. Well, I know James Neesham got his debut hundred. That so everyone will remember that Test match. Yeah, definitely. But you got three hundred, and you're not a. I wouldn't say you're an emotional guy. And I'm not going to say brought tears to your eyes, but you know. It was a pretty special time um, when you reached 300. Can you just just talk us through your, yeah, your, I guess your emotions or what was going through your head at that time? Yeah, it was really bizarre. Look, it's something I'll never forget, honestly. The, the what was it? It felt like, it, was, it felt like five minutes. It was probably 90 seconds where the entire crowd stood up and they were applauding and literally wouldn't sit down. Um, kind of really kind of dawned on me, or not just then actually, it dawned on me beforehand, but that was the moment where I sort of felt just a massive amount of relief. <laughs> you kind of didn't let anyone down. Um, obviously you're proud of what you achieved, but um, it was more that you didn't let anyone down. Um, it's funny, because I wonder if, you know, if you had your time again, would you have done anything differently? I, I don't know if I would. I was so exhausted from the time that it took to, to get those runs and partnerships that we were able to create, but. You know, I just remember that I sort of, I realised this is quite a big, big deal, you know, sort of, and when you achieve big deal sort of items in test cricket, that means a lot to a lot of people. So, yeah, I'm just pleased I didn't let anyone down. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I guess one of the prouder moments I had with you was when we were in Sharjah and it was a, it was a pretty horrible time, uh, the Philip Hughes, um, Test match for, for one of a better term, and, and the cricket was secondary because the way the guys went about things. Um, but it sort of, for me, it taught us a few good lessons. Obviously, it's just a game, 
but also the way we went about playing in cricket from a batting point of view in that match. How do you how would you sum up that test match from the way I guess the team responded to the the situation we were in? Yeah, it wasn't easy. I remember that. It was um again, like I'm not as you know, I'm not an overly emotional person, but I, I sort of consider that a really emotional test match. But I think, you know, any time you look around the, the room and you've got half a dozen blokes crying, not because they knew Phil that well. Um, there's a couple of guys that did, like Luke Ronke was tight with them and, and a few other guys knew him pretty well. But it, w it was almost not so much that. It was just that that could have happened to anyone. It could happen to any one of those uh, in your team or any of the teams that you play with. And cricket's always been about being a bit brave, you know, taking on the short ball or, you know, what, not wearing an a arm guard or an inside thigh guard or something, but it was never life or death, you know. It was like you face fastballs, you get in there, you get stuck in, that's how you do it. But then that moment sort of changed everything and I think that made it a pretty, pretty tough thing to try and work out and, and probably from our point of view as leaders, it was such a difficult, it was such a difficult thing to know how to navigate the team through it because no one's ever been through it before. So, yeah, uh, I mean, in the end, I think that the time that we spent together um, in that initial 24 hours where the game was delayed a day um, and the, the closeness of the group and the relationships which started to really knit together throughout that 24 hours, I think, um, was something which stuck with us for a long period of time. But also then, from a cricket point of view, the fact that the result became irrelevant um, and, emo and and it was about playing for your mates and just playing playing together and not worrying about the competition as such or not worrying about fear of failure. The fact that we went on to hit 25 sixes or something, which is the most in, in, in history by a single team. We beat Pakistan who had just completely um, hammered Australia in those same conditions previously. Um, they were such a formidable side. And we did it playing a style of cricket which kind of opened our eyes, I think, to what was possible if we could could just maybe take away a bit of that fear of failure and just play within play as a as a unit. Um, so like it was a terrible time and you know, you feel sorry for those who are more um, heavily involved in it in terms of Phil and his family, but you know, from our point of view I, I think it really defined us as a team actually. Yeah. You certainly brought everyone pretty close together and um, a lot of empathy around around that. Um, I go forward to 195 against Sri Lanka, Hagley. Hagley was a bit of a good hunting ground for you. And I guess that was still your home at the time, I think. Um, 195, and I think you got out trying to hit a six, is that right? Yeah, I was caught on the boundary, I think. Right. Got a good one, yes, you, you know. Good... <laughs> Every now and then you get a good one. <laughs> Every now and <laughs> then. I mean, we were in trouble. Um, and you, the way you took the game on, you, you know, you counter-attacked and, and changed the game on its head in a short space of time. Um, and yeah, it's interesting you talking about you know living for those great moments. I mean that's that's the way you you wanted to play the game, and, and guys followed you. Yeah, I remember that because it was it was the first game back at Hagley since um, uh, since the earthquakes, and and so it was like right, I'm living here now. We've sort of lived through these earthquakes a little bit as well. Um, full house, give them something to enjoy, you know. So it was a good wicket, and you're in pretty good form. So you just sort of kind of went through the gears a little bit and then I mean you caught on the boundary on 195 it's not a great it's not a, That's but I got a it's a great fitting it's I got a message from Nate Astle straight after he's like thanks mate because because <laughs> I think otherwise it could have been it could have knocked off his 200 record but no it was it was good and again we went and went on to win that test match and boys boys played brilliantly but Hagley was always a, a pretty good ground I think because the bounce on the surface and and also the crowd was always electric when you're down there. And I don't know, there's, there's something about crowds which just, I loved trying to entertain people, you know? That's, that's what I loved about it. And I love the, the fact that people would pay their, their New Zealand dollar or rupee or quid or whatever, and they don't really know what they're gonna get because <laughs> I didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, but if you had a day out, then they, then they could say they enjoyed watching you play. And if they didn't, then they were like, well, at least kind of, you know, you went down swinging. Yeah, and that probably takes me on to the last innings, which was your last one. Um, last test match, anyway, um, at Hagley. And we were in trouble. It was 
it did have bounce, but it had a little bit of nibble as well. And you're batting at five, and you came in, and you certainly carried on that mantra, didn't you? Well, I was sitting next to VJ Watling in the dressing room. I was watching Kane, best defensive game that I'd ever seen at that stage. And he was on seven off 70 balls or something and smacked on the inside thigh, hit on the sort of on the outside of his um, outside thigh. And I was just turning around BJ. I was like, mate, if Kane can't lay bat on ball trying to defend, like, what chance have I got, really? So, so he, he sort of puts hands together like old Charge does, as we call him. He sort of goes like this, he's oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> And then wicket fell not long after, and I sort of walked out there. The crowd sort of rose. It was a really nice moment from uh, the Australian boys as well, and obviously all the crowd. Um, and then sort of first ball, I was like, I'll have a look at one, and it kind of came forward, and it whizzed past my outside edge and sort of bounced, and I was like, oh, bugger this. I was like, if it's, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So I think I tried to hit the next ball, which was quite similar. I tried to hit it, like, over long on for six. And it kind of got a big top edge and flew over the top. And then I was just like, right, just, just swing hard, you know? Let's just try and... There's a bit of method to it as well, I guess, but to me, the, they were trying to hit, like, a good length the entire time. Yeah. Which is the biggest danger for me on a wicket like that. So I was better off changing things a little bit to try and put them under pressure and stop them bowling that length. So I had to take a little bit of courage to do it, um, but I think it... I would have I would have died anyway, if that makes sense. I would have died in the hole anyway. So for me, the odds were were more aligned to having a crack than they were to sitting waiting for the one to have your name on it. So, and I think that's the thing that I don't think many people understand is that um, you don't you don't get those double hundreds, triple hundreds, hundreds in those conditions without a method. And there are times where people think, oh, it's it's reckless or whatever, but it's actually just putting the odds in your favour. And and I think you can be underestimated for the amount of preparation that you put in sometimes. And I'll segue that into the fact when you gave up wicket keeping, you turned yourself into a pretty average sort of a medium pacer, but you, <laughs> but you managed to get yourself a test wicket. <laughs> Do you want to just, that was a moment that I know you, you enjoyed. I'm pretty sure you might have messaged your brother as well. I think I'm reasonably humble as a cricketer, but not when it comes to bowling, you know. I mean, I've got a test wicket, so lots of people don't, including my brother, you know. So <laughs> I feel sorry for Safraz, though. Like, to get out to me was just must have been the, the lowest point of his career. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things which I can always have, have a good laugh about, and I did, I did text my brother straight after. Um, he didn't come back with a very nice response, but... Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a funny moment in, in your career where you sort of look at... I've seen heaps of them, though. Like, the amount of people who just simply cannot bowl who have ended up with test wickets is, is quite remarkable. There's a bit in there for everyone. So I, I won't quote, because I don't know the exact quote, but you talked about the responsibility to test cricket in terms of continuing to entertain and to grow the game. And, and I think as New Zealand cricket fans this year, um, if they turn up to the ground, I'm sure they'll see uh, plenty of entertaining cricket. I'm sure some will be played by the Black Caps, plenty will be played from your changing room, but um, really appreciate your time today. Nice to catch up after a, it's been a long time, and uh, yeah, I wish you all the very well, all the very best in this coaching gig. Pleasure, Hess. Yeah.